Good morning. Our story today is from John chapter 4. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was attracting and baptizing more disciples than John, though it was really not Jesus baptizing, but his disciples, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. This meant that he had to pass through Samaria. He stopped at Suchor, a town in Samaria, near the tract of land Jacob had given to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. Jesus, weary from the journey, came and sat by the well. It was around noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The disciples had gone off to the town to buy provisions. The Samaritan woman replied, you're a Jew. How can you ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? Since Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if only you recognize God's gift and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink instead, and he would have given you living water. If you please, she challenged Jesus, you don't have a bucket and this well is deep. Where do you expect to get this living water? Surely you don't pretend to be greater than our ancestors, Leah and Rachel and Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it with their descendants and flocks. Jesus replied, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty. No, the water I give will become fountains within them, springing up to provide eternal life. The woman said to Jesus, Give me this water so that I won't grow thirsty and have to keep coming all the way down here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and then come back here. I don't have a husband, replied the woman. You're right, you don't have a husband, Jesus exclaimed. The fact is you've had five and the man you're living with now is not your husband. So what you said is quite true. I can see you're a prophet, answered the woman. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you people claim that Jerusalem is the place where God ought to be worshiped. Jesus told her, believe me, the hour is coming when you'll worship Abba God, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you don't understand. We worship what we do understand. After all, salvation is from the Jewish people. Yet the hour is coming and is already here when real worshipers will worship Abba God in spirit and truth. Indeed, it is such worshipers whom Abba God seeks. God is spirit, and, though, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Jesus, I know that the Messiah, the anointed one, is coming and will tell us everything. Jesus replied, I who speak to you, am the Messiah. Ancient words for current consideration. <coughs> Thought it was on. I know. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks for sharing Sunday morning with us. We're in the longest sermon series of all time. <laughs> and part of what I'm hoping to do, although I regularly try to expose you to other uh, aspects of Christianity than the European version, which is very sanitized and homogenized. Um, <clears throat> the roots of Christianity come from all over the world. And when you understand that, when you looked at other religions, you recognize all over the place that there are all kinds of voices there. But if you only studied European Christianity, then you skate right over those stories without realizing uh, the, the rich invitation, not just to sectarian Christianity, but to life itself and to join your human family, all of it. Original Christianity was much bigger and deeper. But what happened is it got kind of copyrighted and then sanitized, homogenized. 
And so in this series, we're holding up traditional passages next to the Sophia passages. The Sophia passages, we're looking at mystical Jew Jewish texts. These texts are in the Catholic Bible, but the Protestants decided there was too much emotion here, too much mysticism. Uh, get, you know, <clears throat> the, the Protestant uh, founders were very uncomfortable with anything they couldn't control and define. So we're, we're trying to enrich and deepen. And the point isn't to agree with me or disagree with me, but to consider how your relationship to the world, to life, to nature might be deepened and broadened and enriched. That's, that's my hope in, in this series. I remember when I was in Sunday school, we didn't have people like Erica, and I would be told these stories by you know, poor little volunteers who you know, weren't really ready for questions. <laughs> they didn't want questions. But even as a child, I saw the fear in their eyes that told me they were skating over the surface of something they did not understand. It had been given to them, but they had never questioned it themselves, and they certainly weren't wanting a little kid to ask questions. When we adopt a religion we don't understand, something very bad happens to our world. And a question that haunts me right now in this place and time in history, after I'd always said, you know, if I was in Nazi Germany, I would have stood up for the Jews. Well, during the Trump phenomenon, Am I willing to stand up for the people being marginalized, victimized? How is it possible that Christians followed Hitler? How is that possible? How is it possible that someone who honestly thinks of themselves as a Christian has put razor wire on the border of this state? So afraid of their human family. so concerned with wealth that they would deprive workers of water. How does it get to that? I don't think it's bad people, it doesn't take evil people, but we do have to be shallow and we have to be narrow if we're going to go down that road. So the Sophia passages can open us to something much deeper. What I discovered in studying, studying other religions of the world is that there are themes that show up all over the world. And those themes are in Christianity, but sometimes they can be harder to see because in Christianity, they're taught with parable stories, teaching stories. Now, I don't know about your experience in life, but I've never seen anybody walk on water. So that's not a real helpful interpretation to me to say Jesus was magical, he could levitate over water. That doesn't bring a lot to my game. If I could levitate, it might, I don't know. <laughs> but ultimately, that doesn't really help me live in the natural world. To have these freakish miracle stories. Their purpose was to awaken us and to deepen us. They weren't saying that Jesus walked on water or rose the dead. They're saying that's what life is like when your heart is tuned to this message of love, to the creative principle of the universe. When your heart is tuned to that, you see miracles all around you. But you just don't have to destroy nature to make that happen. So um, what I want to suggest is that when people told the early stories in the church, they were not trying to get you to believe in a magical person named Jesus. They were trying to get you to enter more deeply into your own life, to your own wisdom. How sad it would be if Jesus came just to brag on himself and yet to leave us in spiritual poverty. I believe that Jesus was a very unselfish person and so he was trying not to fill your head with his ideas, but to set a flame in your mind and your heart 
where you were radically alive. And I think that's what our story is about today. We'll get back to the story in just a second. I want to look at a passage from Sophia, the Sophia verses. This is from the Wisdom of Solomon. We can start. Now remember when they would look and when we're, we're seeing wisdom, they would see Sophia, which is a feminine imagery. The European church didn't want women in such a central role. But we see in, the, in many of these early texts, Sophia was the one that said, take my yoke upon you. Uh, the world was created using me as an architect. So this one says, inside wisdom, there is a spirit of intelligence and holiness that is unique and unmistakable. Then a whole list of qualities here. Subtle, dynamic, perceptive, pristine, unclouded, unconquerable, compassionate, shrewd, compelling, generous, and loving towards mortals, faithful, faultless, serene, directing all, knowing all, and pervading every intelligent, pure, and most subtle spirit. In other words, it's there for us if we tune ourselves to it. But it's not the kind of thing where you pray to Sophia and she does what you want. But the whole purpose of prayer is to tune our hearts to the creative uh, pattern of the universe. Her wisdom moves more swiftly than motion itself. She is so pure that she pervades and permeates all living things. And she's the breath of the power of God. I believe that they're talking about the transcendental ground of being. Because right, no, no object can fulfill all of these qualities, but the transcendent ground would do that. She is a breath of the power of God, a pure light of the glory of the Most High, and nothing that is base can come into her presence in secret. She is the light that shines forth from everlasting light, the flawless mirror of the diamond, diamondism, dynamism of God, and the perfect image of the Holy One's goodness. Though alone of her kind, she can do all things, though unchanging, she renews all things. Generation after generation, she enters into the holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets. For God loves the one who finds a home in wisdom. She is more beautiful than the sun and more magnificent than all the stars in the sky. When compared with daylight, she excels in every way. For the day always gives way to night, but wisdom never gives way to evil. In our traditional story, there's an idea of a well that's there that the, the woman in the scene and, and the genders could be changed. In the symbols, the Savior represents your true soul, your true being. So the genders could switch or you, you can twist that any way you, not, you want. But there's the traditional way of looking at life and then what is deeper? How do we honor the mystery of things? When I began the journey, I felt like I was missing something. I'd been taught that I was missing something, that I needed to find the book that would make sense of things or the teacher that would make sense of things, that there was something missing in me. In the Sophia understanding of the well, what's missing is not something that you don't have. It's deepening your knowledge of who you are. Your consciousness is gurgling out of the ground of being. When a telescope shows the far reaches of the universe, that's, that's you all as well. You are a personal expression of this cosmic process. The ancients knew that. But many of us have forgotten that. And we see nature and the universe as just this background. We don't realize that we are expressions of that. And that creative principle that brings everything into being is what the mystics mean by Sophia or wisdom. If you realize you have everything within you, you're a product of the universe, you're small, uh, 
but, but your consciousness is gurgling out this mystery. So deep within you are the answers that you're looking for. You are an expression of that that you're seeking. In the story, there's a woman who represents our ordinary way, ordinary way of thinking about things. There's Jesus who represents our awakened self. And then there's the well. And the well represents the connection between your personal self and your universal self, that cosmic. You're both of those. And usually the rope represents the connection, or the little bucket, whatever, between the two. This is not just a belief system. If you take God and throw that out the window, and you ask, where do I come from? The cosmos, cosmos is the only thing left. But if you take religion out of it, and philosophy and all the, and you think, where, where do I come from? You're an expression of the universe. And what that says is that whatever that creative principle of the universe is within you. So in this story, the woman is being called to her own source of being. She's wanting and have been taught to think of this as something external. You drink the water, you get thirsty again. Jesus is talking about the ground of your being and saying that if you can drink from that, you will never thirst again. Because I was taught religion, they fill your empty head up with ideas. What this is saying is Jesus sets a fire in your mind, triggers this sense of who you are, where you're infinitely rich, you're coming from an infinite depth within this, this way of understanding it. So it's all the people that drank from the well before got thirsty and died. The well Jesus is talking about, you don't have to believe in it. It's, it's who you are. If you just go deeply into who you are, that's what's being talked about. So when we talk about drinking from our own fountain, the first understanding is to realize that you're an expression of whatever this mystery is. So you don't have to find the teacher, the preacher, you don't have to find the book. Those can be helpful things. But ultimately, if it doesn't lead you to your own heart, it is misled you. And the second very strange idea in mysticism is when you go deeply into who you are, what you find is not this little kind of personal kernel of who you really are. What you realize is the common life. You are the life that is shared. When you go inside deeply enough, we're not separate. We're interconnected. The word spirit means to interweave, to breathe in and breathe out. So without having to believe in anybody's philosophy or religion, life weaves in and out of you all of the time. So in the story, the woman is saying, okay, this well either belongs to my team or your team. But the right religion is either my religion or your religion. Now, whoever wrote this was clearly trying to pacify the people of his time. So he says, well, we Jews are the right ones, right? Which kind of contradicts the whole story. But that may be what people at that time needed to hear. We're the right ones, but there's some other people on the bus. So he says, the time is coming and now is where the Holy Temple is not in Jerusalem or wherever you want to put it. It's, it's everywhere. That when we awaken, first of all, who we are, but also that who we are together. It is within us, but it's not just within us. That we breathe it. That every flower you run across is speaking of a depth that you can't comprehend. That we are surrounded by these mysterious wells or fountains that go down into the ground of things and express it. 
Now, if you think about it, if, a, if, if the ground of being is like an ocean, an ocean, and we're like the fish trying to find the ocean, but it's everywhere so we can't see it, right? You can't step out of it to see it. Then the way you would experience it would be the qualities. It's warm, it's buoyant, it's salty. Now, I don't know the mind of a fish very well, so I'm... I'm <laughs> But when the Sophia passage lists off all of these qualities, what that does is say, you don't have to find a being named God somewhere for this to be real in your life. God is a symbol of the transcendent. God is not a being within space and time, or else God couldn't have been the one that made space and time. So when it says faster than motion, more radiant than the sun, all of those things, you find that all over the world. Of saying, the source of beauty isn't something you can see. The source of music isn't something you can hear. It's all around us at, at all times. So the second meaning of drinking from your own fountain, I believe is realizing that when you go deep enough within yourself, you dissolve into the whole of things. Our egos cannot grasp the universal, but we can dissolve into it. So the worst mistake we can make is say, our God is the right one and everybody else is wrong. The best thing we can do is to realize that everything is some kind of fledgling expression of a ground that, that holds us all. Then the last thing I wanna pose as a possibility <clears throat> is that you are an expression of that. And it's not enough to think it, you have to live it. In Hinduism, there's a saying, the truth you cannot know, the truth you can only be. The little statement about the Messiah. Again, I think Jesus was saying that he considered himself a son of God, but the woman was a daughter of God. Each one of us is an offspring of God, and the pronouns don't matter. The divine name was I am. In the Christian scripture, when you see John, when you see Jesus saying, I am in John, that's the mystical name. That's a trigger for you, and it doesn't work because you don't read Greek probably. But if you did, if that was the language that you were thinking in, that when you would see those words, I am, you would shift gears and you wouldn't be thinking about Jesus anymore, but this depth, this ground of being that's being expressed. I love the inclusive Bible, but it has some really bad translations. And today is one of the worst where Jesus says, well, I'm the Messiah. That's not what the text says. The text says, I am he which again is the mystical name. It could be I am she, we are they. It's being itself. In the mystery religions, the last thing they would do would lift up a mirror. And the point would be to recognize that your personal life is an expression of the cosmos. Not just to think that, not to know it intellectually, but to feel it. And I suspect there are times when you feel it very strong, when you're in nature, when you're on the water, when you're in the woods, and you just kind of dissolve. And somebody says, what is your name? You have no idea. You're not in that gear. What's your social security number? No freaking idea. I'm just kind of here. Those are wonderful moments. And that's what the ancients were trying to share with us. They were having those experiences and they were trying to tell us stories that would lead us to that. It's that wonderful, wonderful experience that we are expressions of the, this creative ground of being, the principles. That's who we are. It's not something we have to do. It's not something we have to know or believe in. It's who we are. And we just have to live it. 
So the third sense of drinking from our own fountain is realizing that you are as much an expression of the creative energies of life as anything. You are as sacred as anything in the Bible. You are an expression of the ground of being as much as Jesus was. Jesus was particularly good at expressing it, but the reason he was expressing it so, was so that you would realize it about yourself. What a shame if Jesus came all this way to talk about how great he is. <laughs> what a sad religion. If you grovel for me the rest of your life, then I promise not to torture you for all eternity. <laughs> now that's somebody who's never really loved. As I say, when I was a kid, I was the discrepancy between what I was being taught and what I saw in scripture was, you know, it drove me crazy, which is why I'm like, I am going crazy. But what it's really talking about is what your life and my life can feel like when we tune our hearts to the creative energies of life and of, of the universe. To drink from our own fountain means, first of all, realizing that because you're an expression of that, you don't need anything outside of yourself. You're missing nothing. So to honor your own roots, but then also to realize everything you experience, every other being weaves in and out of you. It's not just within us, which is why Jesus said it's not here, it's not there. But it's not on your mountain, it's not on my mountain. It's what, it, it weaves us together. And then finally to realize that if we can't find it, it's just because we're not living it. As soon as we live it, it begins to, to take root and give us power. I wanna close with a quote of somebody who I think understood what our passage is talking about, although he hated religion, probably would have hated the story, maybe would have hated the sermon, <laughs> but we can forgive him. This is Camus, and he was one of the first skeptics I ran into as a philosophy major at UT. I really fell in love with the skeptics because I think if, if you can spend time with skeptics, you realize we're not really talking about beliefs. We're talking about qualities, values. And the, 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 the ideas and the symbols and the rituals are all just pointing to something deeper. But this is somebody who is, is famously said he didn't do inspiration. He didn't try to inspire anybody. What he tried to do is give insights. And that's had an effect on me through the years. I don't try to inspire you on a Sunday, which may explain a lot. <laughs> because inspiration comes and goes. But if we're going to have insights about who we are, the inspiration will come, right? When, when you have the roots, the rest of it's gonna grow. So this is, this is from Camus. He was raised in Algiers, oppression, poverty, all of that. He says, poverty kept me from thinking all was well under the sun and in history. Yet at the same time, the sun taught me that history was not everything. Poverty was not a misfortune, Instead, it was radiant with light. And then this famous quote that comes from another book. In the midst of hate, I found there was within me an invincible love. In the midst of tears, I found there was within me an invincible smile. In the midst of chaos, I found there was within me an invincible calm. I realized through it all that in the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. And that makes me happy. For it says no matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me, there's something stronger, something better pushing right back. I think that's what our passage is talking about. So that's my best I can do with our text. We'll take a moment where you can think about how you would understand these words.